Good morning, everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about the different aspects of T9A that you can improve on or um, the different skills involved in being good at this game, at least from my opinion. It is not a tips and tricks video. It's not a, you know, how do you roll the magic phase? It's not going to be that detailed or some, like some of my other videos where I talk about specific rules and how to maybe take advantage of them. Um, it's definitely more higher level than that. Don't be confused by the slides. It's only like four slides long. It's more of just a, at least have a basis for me to talk about without just totally rambling. And I've been wanting to make this video for a while and I just found it very difficult to, to gather my thoughts. And it still is like, it's just very hard to make like slides and slides with all the thoughts because they can go in all different directions. So I'll do my best with what I have. Obviously this is my interpretation after playing a lot and watching a lot of people play. There's obviously, you can go deeper and deeper to each aspect of it, but the idea here is to kind of talk high level of where I see the high, like the skill sets coming from, and then I'll even talk about where I find myself in those, uh, in those buckets as far as uh, how I am made up as a player. A lot of this is selfishly put together because I wanted to reflect on, on myself as a player and work on improving even, even further. Um, I will say this video, you know, if you don't want to do all these things, if you don't want to be the best or, or a lot better, you don't have to. There's no, there's no harm in playing it <clears throat> more for fun. It, I play for fun, but there's no harm in playing it more casually and not wanting to be spend hours and hours looking at things or thinking about things. And and I'm not here to tell you you have to, but for those, I mean, I, I have enough people talk to me that seem to want to improve to some extent. Um, I know people that watch my videos want to improve. Uh, so, you know, you, you can either take this full bore and, and, and try to really dive into everything, or you can maybe, you know, maybe you pick up a, tr a thing or two from this video that, that makes you better, and, and then that gets you what you wanted. So let's, let's talk about at least what I think are some skills of T9A. And I, actually, the reason, and these aren't everything, but they are the big buckets, at least in my opinion. And on one side, I, I put kind of like the natural flow of playing the game, right? You build your list, you deploy, you have a mid game, probably turn two to four, and then you have an end game. Um, that is really the essence of playing the game. While on the right side is more of things that impact, obviously, the left side, but also I think are individual skills that players have it, or players have that not only impact how you play the game, but also how you improve as you, as you play more. Um, what did I want to say about those? I Yeah, and you can be good at some of these and not good at some of these. Um, and that's kind of like why it's a skill thing, right? So if we're talking on the left side, like the list building, deployment, mid-game, end-game, it's hard to talk about those at a very deep level, maybe without starting with the other side, right? Because, you know, just like golfers, for example, golfers have good... Some are really good drivers. Some have their short game with the with the irons are really good. Sometimes their putting is phenomenal, and all that kind of culminates into their total game, as well as their you know athleticism and how can they go through eighteen holes without getting too tired. Blah blah. blah. And your chess is the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about the left side. List building, deployment, mid game, end game. So list building. And we'll actually go to the next slide real quickly. This is a made up percentages very quickly by me. But this is sort of how I value those four things as far as playing the game goes. And so list building, I actually only think is 10% of the whole pie of these four things. I think it matters to the extent that you don't want to hinder yourself too much. But at the same time... It doesn't really matter. You can copy good lists that are out there, um, and you should be you shouldn't be too behind the curve by any means. It's not like Eighth Edition where there really was truly awful, awful units, and if you made a bad list, you could just you would just be dead in the water for most games. Period. So I don't actually find list building to be that important of a skill to be good at T9A. I think. There are really good list builders out there. There's people that find really cool ideas that then become popular and become the meta. Um, but I don't think I don't think you have to have the skill to be good. I think 
I think there are good players out there, really good players that pretty much they just copy other good players list and just play it better or play it equally as good. Um, so that's why I put list building at, at 10%. Deployment, I put at 40. I think deployment is a very, very important part of this game. And everybody will tell you this. I think it's more important for some armies than others. So in my own personal experience, I think it's more important for orcs than it is for, say, warriors. Um, mainly because orcs are blocky. You know, they, if you put a unit here, it, it's very, you know, it, if you think about it, you only have six turns. So you could almost map out where that unit could feasibly get to in those six turns and where the action's actually going to take place for it. Whereas maybe in Warriors, you know, you can put an Elder on the left flank and he can make it to the middle of the board in turn one, depending on where he is, right? So you have a lot more maneuverability as far as that's, that goes. But I do find deployment in general, you know, super important. Where are you going to put your units? You know, what's your strategy going forward? How are you going to win the scenario? Uh, I think a lot of people put themselves a deterrent very early in deployment. Um, and I think what's weird is, in my experience at least, deploying second, you have the advantage of knowing where all the enemy units are, but it still feels way harder than deploying first, at least from my perspective. I think when you, when you deploy first, you get to kind of dictate. You're like, all right, I'm going to put my stuff here. Um, I get to go first, so I get to have the first reaction to where you put your stuff. I get to shoot first, I get to magic first, etc. And when you deploy second, I think there's... You, you kind of now have to say... Now you have to actually say, you know... What am I trying to think of? You need to get something out of deploying second. In a way that whether you stop them from shooting, stop them from hitting your good target, you know, zone them off of certain areas so that they can't get there. Um, you... If you just deploy your stuff like you would you're deploying first and just say whatever, they might get a free unit here that they shouldn't have got. Like, there's a lot of room for mistakes in deploying second, um, especially if the enemy has range and shooting and maybe positional advantages. For example, if they have fast cav with Vanguard and they can Vanguard and get behind you and you have nothing to go kill them, you know, that could be a big deal. So I do actually think deploying second is actually very difficult for some armies and some people. But it's a very important part of the game. I think, you know, we look at mid-game, end-games, and when this will get, we'll talk about this with reflection, but a lot of people reflect on what happens the most recently, like the last turn leadership check or something like that, where maybe the problem was really way deeper in deployment. And so not only is deployment a big part, but reflecting on deployment is a big part. So we'll, we'll talk about that, um, obviously, when we talk about the more ingrained things like uh, reflection experience, all that kind of stuff. Mid-game, this is like turn two to five-ish, um, maybe even three to five. It, you can define it however you want. This is kind of where the game happens. And honestly, honestly, it probably should be mid-game 35, end-game 15, if I can think about it. But mid-game, <clears throat> you know, this is where things happen in Warhammer that you might not expect, right? Deployment, nothing, no dice has been rolled except for like the picking sides and stuff. Um, there's not really any randomness going on. And then comes mid-game, which is, you know, turn one, some stuff happens. Turn two, even more stuff happens. By turn three, your plans are probably naive, not going exactly as you planned because you rolled a lot of dice, some checks have been passed, some checks have been failed, maybe a long charge was made. And now you really have to play the game because one thing I love about T9A is you can do all this prep, you can do all these matrices and list building, and then eventually you just have to play the game. And you have to be good at playing the game in the situation that you're in. So I think, you know, honestly, mid-game should probably even be higher, though. It ties to end-game anyway. And so this is, you know, when we see some of the other skills that we were, I reflected on before, um, mid-game is a big part, you know, has a lot of those aspects in it. And this is where I think the true game happens. I think deployment is super important, and it's, it's, a, it's a definitely like a big stepping stone or a big block to having a good mid game right if you have a bad deployment phase you might just your, your mid game might be so bad because you deployed bad that you don't barely even get to play it um and the in the end game is you know can you scrape up points at the end you know can you win scenario turn five and six do you have a plan where like you know a lot of people 
maybe they didn't move their unit towards the objective turn four, and now they can't make it by turn six. Or vice versa, they didn't even measure it. And then they realized turn six that they never could have made it, and they could have did something else to get points, or hid the unit, or something. So that, you know, I think the end game and how you clean up units, how you finish off, and, and this is maybe some of it's just being mindful of, you know, what's the score at the moment? Oh, if I kill this unit, I get an extra point. I can afford to lose this unit because it won't take me out of the bracket. Like, there's a lot of things in the end game I think people can get better at. But I think just playing the scenario and making sure you get it in the end is very, uh, is very important. Especially with, like, the hold the centers and the secure targets and the spoils. Again, the end game and mid game are kind of blended together. I, I think of it more of just, you know, I've seen a lot of people fumble in the last turn and lose a couple points here or there. So, again, I think it should be probably 15 uh, 35, but it's not important, right? It's, it's, this is just a rough to show you that, hey, list building isn't as important as you think, despite how many people talk about lists um, forever. <clears throat> so that's kind of like the basis of the flow of the game, but it doesn't really say anything about how to get better or what personal skills somebody might have. Um, you know, we all go through those as a player, whether you're bad or whether you're good. I, I will talk more about, you know, at where I feel like I am at those four points of the, in my game after I talk about the other things that I think are very important to being uh, good at T9A. So rules knowledge is number one. I think this one is obvious, but also not obvious. <laughs> I have been the TO for about a year now, and it's shocking, yet not shocking, how bad people are at rules. Um, good players, bad players... If, honestly, on rules knowledge, I am top, I don't know, 1% of players as far as rules. And I have to be because as the TO. But it really is shocking to me how many good players or perceived good players, whatever you want to call it, top upper players, just don't know the rules. And, and it's very, very important. Um, because one... <clears throat> I don't like when people blame opponents for not knowing rules. And I don't know if it's malicious or not, but, you know, you, you have all the control by knowing all the rules to stop people from cheating you, as far as rules are concerned. You have the ability. There's nothing hidden. You, you have everything in front of you to say, you can't do that. And so if you want to be a top player, part of it is being good enough and knowing enough to say, you can't do that. That's not how the, the rules work. There are enough rules in this game and enough army books and special rules that it's very difficult for somebody to know all the rules. In fact, a lot of people mess up their own rules, and I admit, you know, they're better written than 8th edition, but there's still, there's a lot of them. And if two people play things wrong, whose fault is it? The person that gets the advantage, if it's an army rule, I'd probably lean towards the person whose army it is. But, like, you know, if people play maximizing charges wrong, you're both there. That's both a common rule. Like, whose fault is it really? It's kind of both of yours. And so it's hard as a judge to be like, oh, well, that sucks. But, like, you both should have known. And I don't know, you know, are there people out there that know the rules and then feign ignorance? And then, you know, if it's to their advantage, maybe. Maybe they do. Maybe they try to take advantage of people. And you know what? That sucks. That's, that's shitty. And you know, some people have a little more integrity than that when they play, and some don't. But the counter to that is just knowing the rules better yourself. Makes you know what I mean? Like just know them. Like I, I've I've called a lot of people on rules, and not in malicious ways, but just like just know them. You can you have all the skill to know them. You you're getting cheated, no matter what rules wise, is partially your fault, in my opinion. Because you didn't know it. And if you knew it, you would have stopped it. That's simple as that. I mean, that's harsh. but And some people don't want to know other rules. So don't, don't feel, you know, you open yourself up to getting cheated. Um, I think rules knowledge, though, besides just getting cheated and stuff, it's just, for, you know, it just goes through everything that it's on this list and the whole game of, you know, if you don't know you can do something, right? It, let's say preventing cheating aside. Let's just say everybody's honorable and no one che tries to cheat intentionally. Just knowing how things work opens up opportunities to not abuse them, but use them to your advantage. Especially in the mid-game of Warhammer. 
um, the mid game where everything gets messy and it's not, you know, people are fighting and things are fleeing and stuff like that. That is when truly, in my opinion, the best players do things with the rules that can win you the game. Maybe the pursuit rules. I mean, I, you guys have seen my videos. You've seen me talk on the thing. There's rules out there that it might culminate to something that you end up flank charging somebody's unit when they didn't expect it. And now all of a sudden you win the game because of that. And you might not have known to do it because you didn't know how the rules work. So I think rules create opportunity. Uh, and then with that comes experience. Experience is playing the game. You know, we talk about this, play the game, play the game, play the game. You know, you can't sit there and be good at the game and play like once every three months. I mean, maybe if you were really good in the past and you kind of keep it in, but, you know, constantly playing really does help with the rules knowledge part. You get your fresh on rules. Um, it'll help with situational awareness because think about chess, right? People play a lot of chess games and they do a lot of patterns and, and stuff like that. And what happens is they learn by experience that this situation, oh, I've seen this before. I know what to do. Or um, let's say, for example, I've seen, I'm trying to think of a good example. Maybe you're trying to trap a, a ranked unit with your monster. And you're like, all right, I got to know. I got to go this about this far away because I don't want them to get out of my arc or something like that. But that takes, like, you can do all the math beforehand, but kind of until it becomes the experience kind of puts it into you know, it's just natural for you to do it. It's always going to be a hindrance, is what I'm going to say. Um, learning a new army, right? Have you guys, you guys learned a new army? And think about how much thought process goes into thinking about your own rules, wondering where you're going to deploy, looking at your general's range, being like, does this unit, how far away does that have to be from this unit? Um, maybe how things synergize with each other. And that takes a lot of brain power because I think. One thing to note is we're not we're not machines, you know. Think about again going to chess. The best chess players are machines, are computers, and they're not even close to how good. Like they're way above humans. Not even close. It's not even fair, right? And so there is a human capacity to only be able to think about so much stuff and put so much in your brain. And there's no difference in in Warhammer. You know, the rules knowledge takes up a lot, but the more you know them, the more you use them. The, the more natural they become and the more situations you've seen. I'm experienced with the same way, knowing I should deploy here, knowing I have to deploy, oh, Sea Guard can move five inches and shoot 24. Maybe I should be 29 inches away when I deploy. Oh, but, you know, you, you think of all these things and, and all of a sudden you've played enough and you just kind of, you just know it. You just know how it works and it doesn't, and you can focus a lot more on the little things, the things that change, right? You if you don't know how your spells work and you're taking all the time to read your spells, well, that's time, mental capacity taken away from how to play the game. And you want all that stuff to just feel natural. You, you know the casting values. You know the ranges. Um, and that really does come with experience. And you really, there's no substitute for playing the game and just, you know, analyzing it. Um, risk assessment. I don't know why I put these in this order. It's just how I thought of them. Risk assessment. So at its core, Ninth Age is math, right? It's, it's math with, with models that sit on top of it and look cool. But there's nothing, there's nothing other than math and strategy at its, you know, in, underneath everything. What's the chance of this happening? You know, what's the chance of breaking? How many wounds should I do? Blah, blah, blah. And so I don't, maybe risk assessment wasn't the, the best way to put this. Maybe just knowing math was the best way to put it and understanding math and understanding the situation. Um, I think a lot of people understand charge ranges. That's like the most common one, right? People know that, you know, a 12 on two dice is one out of 36, around 3% or less, a little less than 3, 2.7 or something. And, and people know that and they know that it's not, you know, giving somebody a 12 charge is not the most risky thing in the world. Um, but I think when it comes to, you know, fights and, and then magic's one that people kind of get, though I think people don't fully understand the dispelling aspect of it. So I think people totally understand, oh, I need an eight on three dice, it's X percent chance. Whereas I don't think people fully realize that like four versus six dice casting actually goes off like, I forget how much it is, but it's not as crazy as you think. It's like 10%, I think. Like it can happen. And this is where I think, 
not only should you know the math, but I think knowing the math and knowing the variability is not only good just for a understanding it can happen, but also when it comes to reflection, knowing that you didn't just get screwed because you got unlucky. A lot of times when people tell me they got unlucky, I'm like, I don't know, it's like it's like 5% or 2%. 2% isn't a lot, but 2% is rolling roughly 2d6, 12 on two dice. Like, shit, it happens, man. Like, it should happen. That's the crazy part. I think people don't understand that it should happen. Um, and I think people, I think when you, when you focus on dice during a game, like failing a check or, or something, and it, I think it's actually a skill to kind of keep focused on the game and not like whine and, and, and dwell on the bad luck because I think it just makes the game worse from there. There can always be something that goes your way later on, but if you don't give yourself the opportunity to get lucky later on, then because you're so sad about your, you miss two attacks or your cannon miss or some stupid shit, then, um, you're going to lose the game just because of that. And so I think risk assessment also kind of comes in with how the game's going, how the game um, is flowing. If you're crushing it, you might be a little safer if you think you can safely win the game. If you're losing and things are going bad, maybe you have to take some risks. But at the same time, it's not only just the math, but the risk assessment is, for example, I'll give you an easy example. Somebody gives you a 12-inch charge. If you make the charge, it's super good for you. If you miss it, it's, it's fine. You're going to go 2d6, take the highest towards the enemy. Maybe that's fine for you. Maybe you just take the risk there because you don't care because you were going to go like four inches up anyway. You know what I mean? Or maybe it's the opposite. You take this eight-inch swift stride, and that's a pretty good number. Eights, I forget what the percentage is, like 56 or something? It's, like, it's pretty good odds that you make an eight swift. But if you miss it, your unit dies. And your other option is just to move your person into a better position and then get an even better charge next turn. I think I, sometimes I fail in that aspect sometimes where you get all hyphy and you're like, I'm going to roll this. And then you roll a bunch of long charges, you miss all of them, and you're in a shitty position. Whereas if you just would have used your maneuverability to move into the proper, uh, you know, wait a turn, move into the proper location so the enemy can't get away, and you would have lowered your risk there. So, And that, and that comes back to not only risk assessment, but like reflection stuff. People, people love to complain about failing a charge. I'm with you. People love to complain about failing eight swifts or six, seven swifts. I think six swift is the scariest one in the game because that one you should make a lot of the time, but is, is pretty easily to fail as far as math is concerned. And they like to focus on that, and they don't reflect properly. Um, yeah, so those are, I mean, like I said, these are deep topics. Like, you could go all into risk assessment and when you should do things and what the odds are. Um, but I do think it's very important to, to understand the, the, the risks and the, if you fail, if you don't fail, but also just to, like, you should have a basic understanding of how fights go, right? And, and some of this comes with experience. I think some people play by experience, though, when people tell me they never make a leadership 10 check or something. That that's not how to think about things. Experience should be job guide your your thinking. It shouldn't be the only thing. Like, but for example, you know, sometimes when I play games, I charge things. I don't do the math, and then I'm like, and then I get blown apart, and I'm like, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, and I start doing the math in my head. I'm like, oh shit, yeah, that was bad. Like. So, and then and you kind of like learn by experience or the, or the experience of it happening makes you remember it more. Um, but doing the math, especially if you know your matchup ahead of time, doing the math of like how does your unit do versus their unit? Um, and it's not always going to go average. You kind of have to think about like, oh, I should do 10, but if I do nine, you know, what's the consequences? You know, there's a lot of things to think about when it comes to the math side of things. But I think, you know, if you think it's a good for you and the enemy thinks it's a good charge for them, and you give them the charge, and they just charge you. Then you could just you would just lose the game right there, right? Just because they you didn't do the math, and you thought it was really good for you, and they already knew that. Hey, you thought they messed up, and then oh shit, then you die. Um, that's a fun one. Uh, situational awareness. So this kind of comes into the mid game, but also comes with experience, and my and rules knowledge. I mean, everything's a, everything's just everything combined. But what I call situational awareness is the ability to look at a board 
in maybe a chaotic state or a mid game and say, what would you do here? Is there any opportunity to do something funny? Like, I don't know, double, oh, I can double charge this unit, and because of where my champion is, I can cover up their character, which means they can only kill the champion, and I'm going to break the unit, and then I'm going to pursue this direction, I'm going to hit this person in the flank, blah, 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 crap like that. Or I'm going to hit here, and I'll put my other unit here, and because of the way models are removed, um, this guy's going to get out of combat, even though the unit isn't even dead, and he's going to get a free overrun. Those are, I mean, the thing with situational awareness is you can't really... You can't really teach it so much as, unless you take a picture and start talking about it. Like, it really is a mix of rules knowledge and experience. Because these situations, you can manufacture them from a perspective of explaining rules. Like, you can manufacture triple charges, weird things that happen. But when it comes to, like, using them in game to your advantage, you really have to be good at identifying weird scenarios, um, and knowing the rules and how to take advantage of them. I actually think it comes up way more than people think. You know, you have a big scrum in the middle and somebody's just better at whether it's reforming or, you know, a big one we've, we've talked about on the channel. You know, you charge something, somebody thinks they have a flank charge counter set up and then you, like, reform your unit to the flank if you're, like, a long base and now they can't see you anymore. That's like a situational awareness of can you get away with that? And then you need the situational awareness of the other side to know that people are allowed to do that within the rules. And a lot of times that comes with experience. And then you realize you have to actually set up your line of sight so that you can see not just the back of the long chariot base, but the, the center of the chariot base or the mid, you know, two inches up when they turn their flank to somebody. Um, yeah, I mean, situational awareness is just, it's a really big skill. It's hard to teach. Um, you kind of just have to learn it and be good. Um, reflection. Reflection is your ability to obviously look upon all this stuff and say, where are you lacking? What happened during a game? You know, I think a lot of people fail in reflection because they want to blame luck. Everyone loves to blame luck. They look at the end game, they look at some check they made, and then they blah, 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 they bitch about it. And they say, I just got unlucky. Sometimes it's true. Not as much as people think. I, I think you can be unlucky and still play bad. Of course you can. That does, that's, not, that's a dumb statement. What I mean is, I don't know, first turn, your bunker, rerollable nine panics off the board. Why did they panic? Did you put them in shooting range? Did something die close by that you had to be wary of? Um, you know, that, why are your egg, all your eggs in that? You know what I mean? Like... If your whole strategy depends on one leadership non rollable, I mean, I saw a lot of times I'd bank myself on that too. But at the same time, you have to question yourself why. Why did it happen? Um, and then, I mean, honestly, luck, I only go so far. If it's like 10% or something, I don't think you consider yourself unlucky. If you take enough 10% checks, you're going to fail something. You know, if you force enough rerollable nines and that's pretty high odds to pass, it just happens. Like, I don't know what else to say to these people. It happens and you have to deal with it. And, and know the risks of it happening. I don't know what else to say. Um, but reflection on, you know, could you have deployed better? Could you, you know, especially when extreme luck isn't in the case, it, you know, if your vermin demon gets one shot by a swarm of insects, which is super unlikely, then then I'll go to you and be like, well, okay, you can't really plan for that. I mean, there's only so much you can do. Um, in some games, just the reflection is harder because of super extreme stuff. But, you know, the, the normal games that you lose, the ones that you want to blame on the fact that you failed a rerollable seven break check or you did four wounds when you should have did five, it's not that. That's, that's dice. That happens. Um, it really is reflecting on why, you know, could I have played better? Could I have deployed better? Did I miss something in the middle of the game? Did you catch me out on something? Was I lacking rules knowledge? Um, some people don't want to reflect. And I think the reflection is what brings all the other things um, to improve upon. Or it gets you better at all the other things. So those are my nine kind of topics I want to talk about. I'm trying to think if there's something I, I desperately missed. I mean, obviously, you know, being good at movement, being good at um, positioning units, making sure you're in the front, you know, that is all just normal stuff of ninth age. Like you could talk about it, and I think those 
are more like specific videos. I know like Conrad and stuff has made very nice videos on tactics and like tricks and tips. But, you know, think of this from my perspective. So what I, well, the reason I made this video and the reason I'm coming into it with, you know, kind of reflecting on myself now is I consider myself a, a experienced and good player. But I feel like I lack in some of these areas to the point of my detriment. And I'm at the point in playing now that I feel like I heavily need to work on the aspects I'm poor at or else I'm not going to get better at it. Like, I, I feel like I honestly have to say I want to get better at this. And then I think about how I get better at it and then try to improve upon it. Um, and obviously, you know, like I said, this, you could have way more bullet points in this when it comes to skills of T9A, uh, for sure. But these are the ones that I, I, like I said, I wanted to focus on. So let's just, I'll, I'll talk about myself and where I find myself in all of these. So I'm actually going to start with the, the right side because I feel like those are the ones uh, that lead into the ones on the left. So rules knowledge, I, I mean, I think I know the rules just under the rules team. Maybe I don't have that kind of authority or insight, but I, I feel very comfortable with my rules knowledge is not what hinders my ability. In fact, I think it's what thing that makes it better. Experience. I play a good amount of games. I wish I, I... I probably need to play a good bit more to get more experience with different armies and seeing different play styles. Um... Yeah, I, I'm not bad about that. I play enough, but I don't play as much as some of the, the really good players like Thomas does. And so that's always a place to improve. Experience is always one that you can always play more and get better at the game. Risk assessment. <clears throat> um, I waver on this one. I like to do math after the fact. I like to do a lot of math when it comes to casting values, charge distances, average wounds, seeing, you know, Probability, stuff like that. Um, I probably lack sometimes where I get too into my own head, where I don't do them. I don't do it. I'll call it laziness, but it really is. Like, it's just like, I'm like, fuck it. We'll see if it works. And that's fun in, like, test games sometimes. You'd be like, shit, does this even work? And then you see if it works, and you're like, oh, that wasn't even close. And then you do the math, and you're like, oh, it was never close. Um, but I, I think <clears throat> I have the mental tools to do this um which is a big part of t9a you have to be feel you have to be smart enough to do all these aspects right some people just aren't good at math in their head um and they have to make up for it another way i i can mentally i can do it easily it's it's sometimes really just doing it which is a you know that's not it's not a good excuse to just not do it you have to uh yeah situational awareness um because I think my mid game is actually one of my strongest points in Warhammer, I actually think I'm pretty good at this. This kind of comes with the rules knowledge and watching a lot of games. Um, when I view games, and this is actually a way to get better, I think. When I view games, especially from top players like Thomas and stuff like that, you kind of just sit there and be look at you know the fun. The most exciting part for me to watch is the charge phase and the movement phase. I don't really like watching the magic phase or shooting phase that much. You kind of get a sense of, okay, what did he kill? What is he shooting at, maybe? But really, sitting there in the... And maybe the combat reform phase is cool. Um, but really sitting there in the charge phase and saying, is there something here that's weird? Can I, like, charge here, hit the flank here, and hold up this... You know what I mean? Like, stuff like that. that I think that's the only way to get experience and situational awareness without actually playing a billion games, is to watch people play really think about what would you do here and then see what they do and see if they do. And obviously playing, and sometimes even playing worse people, <clears throat> just the, it's almost like a, when chess players do patterns, right? Where there's like a, there's a, um, you know, they give you a board and they say the white to win in two moves and you have to find the move. I think that is something that's similar to this watching other people play and just trying to find the winning moves even if they don't do it being like oh i would have done this thinking to yourself and then maybe thinking and thinking through the process of why would you why would you not um i think that's really that's really important um i think that's really important and a really good thing to do 
Um, and I do that a lot. So situational awareness, I, I consider myself kind of high on that. Reflection, I'm decent about it. I, I try to, you know, there's always moments where if you get shot up or something, um, you kind of get upset. I, I, I don't think I blame luck very often, but I'm more likely to just be like, he did nothing special. I just got shut up or something like that. But that's not true. I think you can always deploy better and maybe the game plan could be better. Um, so I, I decent at reflection. List building. I'm not the best list builder by any means, especially when I'm just sitting around building lists because one, I think I get very ingrained in the internal balance of a book because when you're building stuff on either in your head or on new recruit or something, you sit there and you'd be like, okay, I have 400 points. Oh, this could be this, you know, this, this Feldrake could be a Helmar, or this Helmar could be a Feldrake elder, or blah, blah, blah. And you kind of think about the internal balances of a book. It happened a lot with orcs where you're like, you had 300 points to spend and you could spend it on a lot of things. And you kind of think about what internally is the best thing or what you just, for some reason, feels the best and not really what the army needs. And I think um, a quote from a good player, again, it was Thomas, who I talked about a lot, was, you know, sometimes the best thing for the points isn't what the best thing for the army, right? It's kind of like if you think this X unit is super good for its points and you take six of them, well, maybe the fifth and sixth one aren't what the army needs, even though it's not the best quote-unquote point-for-point thing, right? The redundancy is, is not actually a good thing. And to be fair, let's be honest, in, in T9A... A lot of units are very similarly, fairly priced, right? Um, and people are going to argue about that. But, you know, sometimes, like, just because something is, we'll say, 15 points more efficient, who cares? 15 points of 4,500 is, is, like, nothing. It's like taking a binding scroll and never using it or something. Whereas, you know, maybe the options it brings or the dynamic it has in the list is just worth it more. So I, I do think sometimes from a list being perspective, I have like cool ideas and maybe how to optimize things like points wise, like, Oh, you can drop this, get another model there. But I think I'm not very unique in like building, building lists from the ground up. I think I'm much better at taking things from other people, maybe changing it to how I feel or, or talking through situations and then having people tell me why they like things and then going from there. So I'm not the best list builder in my opinion. Um, I would like to improve on my meta list building. I think this is like a deeper topic as well that basically involves thinking about what's out there. So, for example, you know, we'll take Warriors, for example. Taking a Warriors list and saying, okay, this is the list I feel is pretty good. And you look at the units and you say, well, what's actually common out there, right? What's, what's popular? If, if Pyromagic is becoming more and more popular than Elders, I mean, Elders look even better because elders are, you know, they don't give a fuck about pyro for the most part. Um, whereas, uh, what's a better example? Maybe orcs are a better example. Orcs, right? I well, the one list that did very well in the in the Spanish tournament had no cannon targets except maybe one cowboy. And thinking about, it, you're like, okay, div and cannons are actually pretty common. Sometimes it's really hard on pairings, and maybe it's just better not to have any targets. I played it at Archive List without any cannon targets except cowboys by themselves, but they had units to go in. And then it feels nice that you like you don't have a monster that gets sniped by a cannon. Um, but at the same time, you know, I tend to build very aggressively combat armies. I don't like a lot of shooting. I like very efficient magic phases. Um, but sometimes, you know, taking one or two things that's not good versus cannons, but the rest of your army is, and then you can say, all right, well, not everyone has cannons. If they don't have cannons, this piece is really strong. And if they do have a cannon, you hide it. You just, sometimes you have to hide things, you know what I mean, or take a chance. So I think I can get a little caught up in list building where I get like I, I go all in on something and I'm not very well rounded. I'm much more likely to copy a unit than I am to diversify. Um, so yeah, I, I I am not the best list builder. I don't. I would not put it as a strong point, but it's also not something that I'm eager to get like super good at. I, I like talking about lists and, and talking with other good players and modifying things, but I don't feel like this is holding me back so much. Like, oh my God, if I was just better at building lists, 
I'd be a way better player. And I think it would make me more cool and that maybe I'd come up with like a meta build or something and influence her, but I don't think it changes much. Um, deployment. So hands down, I think this is my weakest aspect of a player. Like not even it's not even close to me how bad I feel at deployment slash game plan. And that sounds like a big thing. Hey, being bad at the game plan is pretty bad. Yeah, I admit that. But I'll come back to the deployment. I think my end game and mid game is is well above most people. Um, I think if you put me in a game turn three or four, even turn two, I think I can play it maybe not as well as everybody, but I think I'm way up there. Like, I, I, you know, put me in a mess and let me unravel it. I, I think that's where I strive as a player. Like, the whole situational awareness, mid-game, like, you know, I think my problem is getting there uh, appropriately or to the best, of the, getting there to the best it can. I, obviously, you know, when I talk about deployment and I talk about being bad at deployment, listen, I, I'm good enough to beat most people, average players out there. That's not the problem. You know, and that's not really what we're talking about here. It's, it's, it's the scale isn't to me. The scale isn't, you know, zero being beating a scrub and a hundred being, you know, the best ETC player. You know that if, if that's the scale, then my deployment is like eighties or nineties, right? What I'm saying is, f- screw the scrub scale. I'm talking about ETC level players. I feel like I'm on the lower end of those people when it comes to deployment. And like I said, it, it depends on the army I'm playing. It depends on the matchup. Uh, I just feel like sometimes I don't know what my plan is all the time. Or like it could be better. Or I don't see everything until like turn two. Or I'm like, fuck, I didn't think about that in deployment. Um, I do think that's one reason I kind of shifted back to Warriors is because... I think they excel in the situational mid-game because they are so fast. They have so many single models. They can kind of abuse things like that. Whereas, you know, if you put a Feldrick Elder on the flank, you can just move it to the middle if you need to. It has a lot of... You have a lot of options to get yourself out of a bad deployment as opposed to Orcs. And this wasn't why I quit Orcs, but, you know, Orcs are a great example of if you deploy bad, you're kind of stuck where you are. Um, and so I feel like warriors give me some of the best options to get out of the deployment phase, uh, relatively unscathed. Um, but obviously with playing other armies, there's always room to improve there. And so I think deployment, I, I'm really, I want to get better at it. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think it comes from like, I don't know. It just felt when I was playing the Dark Elves and the Orcs a lot that that I would just sometimes not. I don't know. I, it's hard to describe because this is when it comes about how to improve upon some of these things. Like I'm not a hundred percent sure how to improve this part of the game. Whether it's talking to good players and saying why did I play there? Or maybe I have to put more folk. I I think part of it is thinking. It sounds dumb, but I think you know. When it comes with comfort and experience, eventually I got pretty good at deploying my work army, but I feel like I lack it in the beginning. I just kind of put things down and really think about how the game's going to go. And, and sometimes in my rush to play, because I'm a faster player, I definitely don't take forever. Almost like I internally rush myself and say, let's just get it going. This looks pretty good. What could go wrong? And maybe I miss a thing here or there. Or I miss being able to hide a unit or put a unit out of range. And maybe if I just worked on taking myself and saying, all right, listen, take 10 minutes, take 15 minutes, deploy this army, especially deploying second. I'm pretty bad at deploying second. Um, just take a second, deploy, and really think about how the game's going to go. And do you need to contest that objective? Do you, can you leave it alone? If, you know, oh, he has a scoring unit there. Do I have to put something in front of it? Is it even worth it? If I don't put anything on that side of the board, um, Will I be okay? And I think this also, when it comes to deployment, maybe first two turns, we want to talk about that fully, is I'm very aggressive, like super aggressive player, in my opinion. Maybe not as aggressive as some people I know, to their detriment, but I like to push. I mean, I push in almost all my games. And maybe that's another reason I've shifted back towards Warriors, is I feel like they just, that's what they do. They can push really well. 
But in the first two turns, some, especially deployment, sometimes I'm not willing to sit back a little farther. Like I have to be on the like I have to be as close as possible. But let's be honest with you. If you really want to give a little deeper into this, let's be honest, right? How many times do you deploy first and move everything maximum movement forward? It doesn't happen that often. Like some matchup, sure, some units, sure, but like, like it's not like all my elders run sixteen inches turn one every time. So putting them near the back of the board or off the front line by a couple inches to avoid some shooting doesn't really hurt me. Like it maybe gives my enemy a little bit more space to move forward, but let's be honest, like it's not like I'm running sixteen inches forward. Like let the game develop. I think I think that's the problem I have in the deployment. It's that. I, I sometimes deploy weirdly, and I and I and I rush it. I rush thing. I want to be too far forward, and then I don't let the game develop to where turns three, where it's like the magic happens. That's where you're really playing the game. Turn two and three, four, right? And so I'm trying to work on that somehow. So so I don't know. I don't know how to get better at that. But that was the point of this video was just to basically reflect on the fact that I feel like I'm bad at that part of the game. That's the worst part for me, knowing what to do sometimes not all the time but that yeah like this unit should fight this like i don't know throw me in the middle of the game so i want you guys to think about where do you lack in some of this where are you really good at what can you get better at um you know are you are your rules knowledge lacking how do you get better at rules knowledge read the rules watch other people play and think about the rules um a common thing I do is just randomly look up a rule in a book or you're watching somebody play a unit and you're like, oh, okay, what does this guy do? Oh, and then you read about it. You don't need to read the rule book front to back and you're never going to memorize that like that. A lot of it comes with playing, looking things up, discussing rules, not being an asshole about it, knowing how to read the rules, looking at the forms. I mean, the only form that I follow on the T9 form is the rules form because I just like reading it. Like every time there's a new post, I just read somebody make a post and I read the answer and I'm like, oh shit, look at that. Um, where do I, uh, where do I think people really lack? I think, man, I think if people were just better at rules, it would really help. It also helped me with the rulings and people complaining about being cheated. Um, if people just knew the rules, uh, I think that's a big one. Like a, a big deter, uh, you know, hinders a lot of people inherently is rules knowledge. Uh, experience is always going to be something. Be able to reflect. You know, you can play a million games, but if you don't reflect and properly think about things, um, it's not going to be any helpful. Uh, what else we got? Uh, probably deployment is probably a big one too. The one I'm bad, I'm worse at, is probably one a lot of people are bad at. Because like, like it kind of like you used to be able to get really fucked in list building, and I don't think you can anymore as much as you could back in the day. So I think deployment is the deployment and lack of rules or understanding of the enemy army is the biggest like you just screw yourself. Like right, imagine chess you kind of just imagine it's like in chess. If you if you open the wrong way, if your opening is bad and you just screw it up, you could just be lost instantly or super on the back foot. You know, no matter how good your end game is, right? If you don't get to the end game, it doesn't matter how good your end game is. That's that's kind of a way to put it. Um, I I played a little bit of golf, and I was I'm so bad at all of golf. But it didn't matter how good of a putter I was. I never made it to the green in enough shots for it to matter. Um. So while there is something to be said of uh, improving your putting, if you can't make it there, it doesn't matter. Go play mini golf if that's the case. Uh, and so I think, you know. Since one thing comes before the other, you kind of have to almost work it in, in, in line. Some people don't want to be better. And I don't know where like this goes from here. I think it's just kind of, I just wanted to talk about all the different aspects that I liked and, and thought was uh, important. And it kind of was for me to kind of reflect on myself and say, if I truly want to get better, where do I need to go and, and do that? And I would, to kind of sum it all up, I need to... Play more games where I truly think about my deployment and analyze it and then play the rest of the game. I, I think that would make me, that is where I falter a lot of the time. 
obviously you can improve on everything, nothing uh, playing and getting more rules, knowledge, and situational narrative. That, oh, it's going to come and go. But think about, you know, to all my fans watching, think about where you really feel like you lack. And, and think about what I said and what can you do to improve if you want to improve. You might not want to, you might not want to do the math. You want to play and you want to charge something and get blown up, and that's fine. I'm not t- here to tell you to be the hardcore player in the world. But if you want to improve, you know, if you're not going to put the work in to get better at those things, don't complain when people beat you. I think that's probably the hard. And when somebody's better than you because they put the work in, you know, that's just shit happens. You know, if you want to improve little things here or there, I'll tell you, I would go for rules knowledge. I would try to learn the rules. Um, do a little bit of math here and there. You don't have to do the deepest math in the world. You don't have to be like, what's the channel? You know, he attacks you. Just, just kind of have a good idea. And I would say open your mind to to luck. I didn't focus on luck a lot in this video. I have videos on luck before. But just try to take your mind out of luck. I think that is a big that is a big blocker for a lot of people. They, they, they end the game, some bad roll, blah, blah, blah. And then their first, boom, their first instinct is luck. You can feel the instinct. Oh, that sucked that I, you know, it sucks. That's the best way to put it. I, it sucks that this happened. But if you casually reflect on the game even more, or not casually, but if you reflect on the game even more, you, should, you really got to peel back that luck and say, ooh, I didn't like that I did this. Well, this was pretty bad. Or I could have did this better. And I, Because I think if you just stop at the luck part, your brain shuts off, and then nothing matters that you did. You didn't gain any experience because you just focused on the luck part of it. Or I got cheated because of this rules thing. And I, I, this is probably, my, it's funny, my soapbox for this video. It, it, you getting cheated on the rules is your own damn fault. Because you didn't know it yourself. There's nothing secretive in this game. He didn't slip an ace from his, you know, his hand, up his sleeve into his hand. You, you, they, the cards are on the table. Besides, like, blatant cheating of, like, dice and stuff. You know, we're talking about misplaying rules. It, it, half of it's your fault. Uh, yeah, feel free to comment. Um, I, I, you know, I do like to make videos on very specific things, explaining rules and how they interact with each other. Watch those if you want to get better at some things, especially like overrunning and combat reforms. That kind of goes into the rules knowledge and how to how to use it to your advantage. But yeah, feel free to comment if you have any questions, any commentary on where you. I mean, I'd be curious for my fans out there. Where do you think you lack in the game? What is some? Where do you think you can get better at something? And how do you think you can get better at it? Like, I think I have to just play, really think about my deployment, and maybe even take pictures and then ask my friends who are good players, hey, what, what was wrong with my strategy? Is there something I did wrong in, in, in the beginning? That is, like, that is truly where I, I feel my biggest weakness is. And, and I want to get better. I, I do want to get better. I don't like losing. I hate losing. Especially for, for those who know me. If I play a game at night, and I lose, I, I, I may not even fall asleep for the next three hours. Like, I've, I've laid awake in bed just being like, God, and I think about the game, and I reflect on it. So <laughs> maybe some of you don't have that kind of care, but, and that's okay. But uh, anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for sitting through this, this long diatribe of, of, of skill stuff, and uh, I'll see you on the next video.